All four evangelists take notice of this passage of Christ riding into triumph to Jerusalem five days before his death. So we are five days out before he is to be crucified. The Passover was on the 14th day of the month. Everyone say 14th day of the month. And this was the 10th. And this is what is so cool about that. And if you go back into Exodus, on the 10th, on which day the law appointed that the Passover lamb, the Paschal lamb, should be taken up. As it says in Exodus 12, 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household, and set apart for that service on that day. Therefore, Christ, our Passover lamb, who was to be sacrificed for us, was publicly showed. Isn't that amazing? I'm a theology geek. You may not be, but I am, and I think that's the coolest thing in the world. That thousands of years prior to Jesus coming on this planet in his fleshly form, when the law was given, the Passover lamb was to be taken up and displayed in front of everyone's household, shown and given, amen, and to be slaughtered later on, on the Passover night, Jesus, in the same way, on the 10th, fulfilled being the Passover lamb and publicly presenting himself under the constraints of the law, the Mosaic law. Remember, Jesus said, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And everything he did, he fulfilled the law completely. And, oh, man, I'm just, oh, gosh, I can't even tell you. Including introducing himself, saying, I am now your Passover lamb. Entering into Jerusalem on the 10th day, when the Passover lamb was being prepared, he is saying, I'll be sacrificed so that you can be forgiven. Man. See, Jesus didn't miss one detail. And as you go through, this is just a side note, as you go through the prophets, he fulfills to every little jot and tittle what they said about him. Everything. And we're going to see that again here in just a little bit. It's so cool. That just, it floats my boat. So we see that we are five days out before Jesus is to be crucified. So this was the prelude to his passion. So he lodged at Bethany, a village not far from Jerusalem for some time, and at supper there, remember this was on the sixth day, six days before his death, at the supper there, that was when Mary came and anointed his feet, and so then on the very next day, he entered into Jerusalem. Now again, isn't that cool? Mary shows up and anoints his body for burial, and the very next day, he is on his way into Jerusalem. Awesome. So let's read, starting in Matthew 21, verse 1, says this. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now, again, this to the disciples must sound ridiculous. It's like when Jesus looked and he had to pay the temple tax, and he looked at Peter and he said, Peter, go fishing, and the first fish that you pull out is going to have a coin in its mouth, and we'll use that to pay the temple tax. <laughs> Peter's like, okay, right, I'll just go do it. To show you how goofy you are, you know. And then Peter goes and does it, and the first fish he pulls out, there is the temple tax. It's the same thing with the loaves and the fishes. Remember, he says, how many fish, how many loaves do you have? And they said, we only have this much. They said, give them to me. And they're like, okay, here. You know, and then he multiplies them and feeds thousands of people with all these just little loaves and fishes. So they're getting used to Jesus asking crazy things and seeing them come to pass. Now, I want to make a translation into our life through the gospel of Christ that, and I've said this before, but where there is a God-given vision, where there is a God-given direction, when he asks you to go do something, there will always be God-given provision. It doesn't matter how crazy it sounds, and God is going to ask you to do some crazy things. He asked me to do a crazy thing five years ago. He said, Louis, leave the church that you've been at for almost, I don't know, 15 years and go a plan a church. That sounds like a really good idea. I know you've never been a head pastor before. I know you've only been a worship pastor and you really have no idea what you're doing. But leave the comfort of this really great paying, long-standing, successful, international ministry church, all right, 
and go and start a church up north in Stapleton. Okay. There's a lot of times that Jesus won't put the ducks in the row until you step out. Hey, man, we left the church with $2,000 in our pocket. That's what they gave us to launch. Okay, if you've never launched a church, that's nothing. All right, that's like a month of rent. Right on, let's go, $2,000, you know, and leaving my, and we cashed out my retirement, which wasn't a ton, but it was some, because we needed some stuff to work on. We didn't know how this was all going to work, and all of a sudden, God started putting all the pieces together. And every day, each and every month, it's just supernatural what God has done in the presence of this church in life song. And it's the same for your life, individually, that when he asks you to do something, you can go in the confidence that when you get to untie the donkey there, it's going to be there. So the disciples went to get the donkey. Another great thing about this is that it says in Matthew 21, 4 and 5, that all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, Jesus is king. He is our Lord. But it was interesting to me that he didn't come into Jerusalem with the fanfare of a king. A king would never ride on a donkey. He would ride in a chariot or on a horse. He would present himself haughty with lots of fanfare going before him. And Jesus, in his usual humble, serving way, came in on a donkey. So that's one aspect of it. But the other aspect of it is that he also signified by writing, let me just read it because I don't want to miss it. The significance of this fulfillment is huge. First, there is the fact that Christ entered on a donkey. Horses and chariots were reserved for kings, but the judges of Israel rode upon donkeys. Did you know that? If you go back to judges, the judges of Israel rode on donkeys. That's how you knew that one was a judge. So here, Christ is stating that he is the rightful judge of the people of God. And through his death, he has judged us as righteous. Now think about this for a minute. Most scholars believe that this prophecy was made somewhere between the ages of 515 and 520 B.C. when that prophecy I just read to you was written in Zechariah. That is over 500 years before Jesus made his triumphant entry. Now, why do I give that information? Because you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna face some very intelligent atheists and unbelievers out there. And one of the greatest things you can say is, you know what? When Jesus came to earth, he fulfilled things that were told about him some 500 years before he even got to this planet. Isn't that crazy? The Zechariah said that he was going to come in on a donkey. Behold, your Messiah comes in on a donkey. And 500 and something years later, Jesus rides in on a donkey. And then we also, again, have the significance of him saying, I am the rightful judge of the people of God. And that is so huge because he has now, as Hebrew says, become our mediator. So when you go to stand before the Father after you die and you have Jesus as your judge and your mediator, he stands before the Father and says, I judge him righteous. Remember, Father, I'm the rightful judge of the people of God. And that's good news for us because when I get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of things that God's going to be like, hey, son, we need to talk. And Jesus and I will probably have that talk. We probably, you will. You're going to go and hang out with Jesus at some point in the everlasting because you're going to be you're an eternal being, so there's going to be plenty of time to get to you. And you're going to have to take a walk with Jesus because it says that every man will hold account for what he does with the things that God has given him. So we're going to have this very loving brother to brother because Jesus is our elder brother, and he's going to talk to us about, hey, there are some things we could have done better, right? But thank God that when you stand before the all-powerful God the Father, the King of the universe, remembering that in Revelation that it says when he even barely begins to move, it's like thunder and lightning, and people fall before his presence on their faces, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, God Almighty. I'm talking about a being who said to Moses, you will never see my face. No man can see my face and live because of the glory that comes out of it. 
talking about the God that when he came down on Mount Zion, it began to shake and tremble and almost buckle under the pressure of his glory. <laughs> and you're going to stand before that being one day when you enter into the throne room and he's going to, Jesus is going to step forward and say, I'm the rightful judge. Hallelujah. He's mine. Stand in front of you and guard you from the wrath of the Holy One. Because God has no choice but righteousness. That's who he is. That's what he is. And so when sin cannot stand and live in his presence. And so Jesus, who became our sin, inherited the right to be our judge, and now steps forward and says, I judge them as righteousness. Praise the Lord for that. Again, this prophecy was made some 500 years before Jesus made his triumphant entry. Let me just say on that that there is, this is your fill-in, there is no expiration date on the promises of God. (laughs) You may not see today what you were promised yesterday, but rejoice and hold on because there are still a lot of tomorrows. Think about this for a moment, people. The the children of Israel have been waiting hundreds, if not thousands of years, hearing about the prophecies of the Messiah that is coming. They waited patiently and patiently and patiently. And some of them probably thought, you know what, man, I'm just going to give up because this isn't coming true. And generations passed on. People died. People who were waiting for the prophecy to happen. Well, guess what? God fulfilled his word. He was faithful to it. The Bible says that he is not a man that can lie. He cannot lie against himself. So if he has promised you something, if he has given you his word, which we have right here, and there are lots of promises in it, you can rest assured that even though you don't see it today, he will fulfill the promise. So what does that do? That puts us in a place of living in an area of thankfulness and rejoicing unto God because we don't have to be unsure. It is not an I don't know. God told me this, but eh, it's been a while, huh? Just keep holding on. I was listening to a pastor one time, and they were saying, you know, just because you don't see it doesn't mean that God's not working. How do you know that he's not positioning things, changing things, getting things ready? Come on now. Let's think about it again for this church. We met in a hotel for four years. I was praying desperately for a home. We were tired of setting up every week. That's a lot of stuff to set up. And getting there early on snowy mornings and you're cold and you're wet and you're like, you know what, we just want to not do this today. You know, I know that sounds very unspiritual, and but it's truth. After a while, after four years of doing it, you get tired of doing it. And we are standing and believing that God would bring us to a place where we didn't have to do this anymore. Well, I could have gotten, we could have gotten discouraged and said, you know what, it's not going to happen. Let's just give up. What was going on? What was going on is that God was moving Pastor Mark here. For those of you who don't know Pastor Mark, he's the guy that leases his building. He's the one that owns or leases the peak. So God was positioning him and moving him here and waiting. And he was just like, okay, just hold on a minute. I've got it coming. I've got to orchestrate this. I've got to move this. I've got to put this person here. I've got to make this happen. Open this door. So in your life, church, even though you don't see it right now, doesn't mean that God's not working on your behalf. Think about it. Those thousands of years that they waited for the Messiah, Jesus or God was having to line up things, getting the people ready, getting this world ready. He was putting things in in motion and process. So hold on this morning. Don't give up. Don't quit. In Romans 4, it says this. He was talking about Abraham. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. I love this. But was strengthened in faith. Giving glory to God and being what? Fully convinced. Everyone say fully. Being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. See, the reason that I love that is not only did Abraham just hold on, but every day that went by as he was holding on, he got stronger. His faith got stronger. He was fully convinced. And every day that passed was just another day for his faith to grow. Amen. He did not waver. He did not give up because God had told him, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And so he held on. Hebrews 6, 13 through 20 also says this, talking about Abraham. He says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, 
Because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, everyone say endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, you are an heir of promise. Everybody say, I'm an heir of promise. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. I love this. This hope we have as an anchor for our soul. Both sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner, Christ Jesus, has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. See, the hope that you have in God's word is an anchor for your soul. You may not be today what you want to be tomorrow, that's okay. Hope in Christ alone because the work of the gospel, the surety that Jesus came out of the grave just like he said he would. I don't know about you, but, man, I want to hang out with a guy that predicts his death and resurrection and then does it. There's a lot of people. Did you know there were a lot of people that predicted the same thing and didn't do it? Jesus did it. So anybody who can do that, I am down with. All right? Well, just as surely as he promised that, that he would rise again and did and showed himself to over 500 people, that when the book of Acts were written, were still alive and read the book of Acts and could stand up and say, I'm one of the 500 that he presented himself to. All right? So there is surety in the fact that he rose from the grave. And not only that, they can't find his body. They can't find any bones. All right? Jesus is gone. <laughs> He's reigning on high, the high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. That hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ should reassure your hope in the things that he has promised for you through the gospel. So don't give up this morning. Hold on. Allow every day that passes just another opportunity to make your your faith stronger. Amen? Okay, let's go on here. So, in our notes, second page, it says so. Or for me, it's second page. I don't know if you forget. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. (laughs) And then they brought the donkey and the colt. (laughs) Imagine that. Laid their clothes on them and set him on them. Your feeling is this. It is better to be foolish in your obedience to God than wise without him. Again, think about how silly... (laughs) The disciples must have felt walking up to this guy. All right, so, again, I want to bring this to life for you. Jesus says, go. Go get this donkey and this colt. It's going to be tied over there at this guy's house. Tell the dude that you need it, that the king has need of it, and he'll give it to you. All right? All right, Jesus, we'll go. So they go. They walk up to the house, and sure enough, there's a colt and a donkey. All right? They're like, oh, no. And then they probably see the guy, like, over there working, you know, doing whatever he does. And so they're probably like, you go talk to him. No, you go talk. You go tell him. No, you go. go you. And finally, they probably push Peter or somebody out there. You know, Peter's like, oh, you know, and comes up and goes, okay, well, you know, we noticed that you got a donkey over here and a colt. We, this is going to sound really funny. We, we follow this guy named Jesus. Have you heard? Oh, yeah, I know Jesus. Okay, cool. Well, he needs your colt and your donkey. Well, you mean rent it? No, we're not going to pay you for it. He just needs it. So you want to borrow. Yeah, well, it might come, it might not. I don't know. He, he kind of does strange things sometimes. I mean, you might get it back. You might not. Can we borrow it? I mean, think of how I feel awkward sometimes going over to my neighbor's house and asking, asking for a wrench, you know. I don't want him to know that I don't have a wrench. I need to, anyways. But, I mean, think about it, how awkward that must have been. But, you know, it's better to be foolish in your obedience to God than wise without him. Roman, or 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 29 says this. I'll read it to you. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 
But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? (laughs) For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you, see your, for you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence." God's going to ask you to do some things that sound pretty silly sometimes. Rest assured. The message of the cross is foolishness to the world. When you compare what God is asking you to do through the lens of the world, it's going to look silly. There are things that God might be asking you to do that sound completely and totally foolish. That's all right. Let people laugh. Let them laugh. People laugh at me all the time. I don't care. I'm following him, man. Because he doesn't let me down yet. There has not been one time where it's been like, you know what, God, you, you missed it on that one. <laughs> no, he hasn't done that. He, even though it sounds silly and foolish, hey, man, that's where his treasure is. Amen. It's better to be foolish in your obedience to God than wise without him. All right, so let's go on. So now we're going to see the working of the gospel in this story in its entirety, and I'm going to sum this thing up. So it says in Matthew 21, 7, and I combined John 12, 12 in there because we had to get a little best of both worlds. It says, they brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And when they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. See, in the same way that Christ came to his people in this lowly world, not as a triumphant king, but as a gentle and lowly savior, he has faithfully come to us. Jesus presents himself to the unsaved. He chases after us. He talks about how he is the good shepherd and he will go after the one that is lost and leave the 99 righteous. He presented himself to me on a night when I was lonely and desperate. I'm sure that many of you have the same testimony. It wasn't you searching for him. It was him chasing you down. And here we have Jesus presenting himself to Israel and saying, I'm coming to you even though you have refused to listen to me. Even though you have despised me. Even though you have literally in five days, and he knew this, you are going to kill me. I'm coming to you. Aren't you thankful that you serve a Jesus who came to you, found you when you were down and out, when you were broken, when you were lost, when you were hopeless, when you were addicted, amen, when you were dealing with the things that you were dealing with, Jesus met you and interrupted your life. He stopped you in your tracks, and he says, I've come so that you can have life. He didn't say you have come so that you can have life. He said, I've come to you. The creator of the universe, the one who is righteous above all righteous, loves you so much that he is chasing you down all the time. Wherever you go, whatever you do, he is chasing you. Even though, think about this, Jerusalem despised him. The majority of the people there did not want to hear his message. They tried to stone him and kill him several times. But yet here he goes, riding in Jerusalem on a donkey. Here I am for you one more time. And that's the character of our Jesus. That's the news of the gospel is he will come one more time every time. So if you're running today, if you're on the lamb, he is chasing you. And that voice that you hear is his love saying, come back, son. Come back, son. What are you doing? Why are you out here? Why are you doing this thing? You're better than this. I've raised you. I've got a destiny for you. Come on now. He will always be in your ear. Praise God for that. Your fill in here says Christ's saving grace can be subtle and unexpected, but it is but it always results in triumphant certainty. Hmm. 
It'll hit you when you're not ready for it. Right? I've told you my testimony, and many share the same testimony, but I mean, it was just for me, church, and it probably is for everyone. It was just this gentle knocking. You know that Edgar Allan Poe, that Poe, who gently wraps up my door. That's what it was like. It was just this gentle. I know you're in there. And I'll never forget that night, man. When I had come to the end of myself, I'm not going to get into it, but I hit the lowest of low, and Jesus, when everyone else had left, Jesus was there. And I can tell you some 20 years later, that even though it came subtle and unexpected, it always results in triumphant certainty. Hallelujah. Revelation 3.20 and 21 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Isn't that cool? See, that's what saved me, church. Because I had heard the message of being righteous and living morally, and that didn't interest me. What captivated my heart is when I found out that Jesus just wanted to have a relationship with me. So he wants to come in and have dinner with you. There's few things more intimate than inviting somebody into your house for dinner, is there? Jesus says, I will come in and I will dine with him. Hallelujah. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Let's go on. Matthew 21, 8 through 11 says this. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from trees and spread them on the road. And then the multitudes who went out before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, the King of Israel. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And so the multitude says, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, again, I just want to make this come to life for you. It, where Jesus was riding into started on this huge hill, and he started to come and descend into Jerusalem. And this chorus of praise and resonance began to be lifted up, and it was kind of like, you know, the wave at, the, at a football game or something. It just slowly cascaded over and over and over again, and it began to just reverberate and echo throughout the city of Jerusalem. Man, it just gives me chills thinking about it. And think about those in Jerusalem who are looking up and wondering, what's going on over there? Who is this? And they begin to prophesy. It says they begin to prophesy that this is is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. See, when the eyes of the heart, this is your notes, when the eyes of the heart are truly open to his amazing grace, the mouth open wide, opens wide with amazing worship. We talked a little bit about this last week, but when the eyes of the heart are truly open to his amazing grace, the mouth opens wide with amazing worship. 1 Corinthians 14, 24, and 25 says, But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus, this is the part I want you to hear, this is the act of salvation, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. See, that's what was happening here. There was a move of the Spirit happening here, and some believed and some didn't. But all of a sudden, this reaction began to take place as the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Word of God, the one who is, was, is, and is to come, the Alpha and the Omega. Think about this for a moment. Riding in on a donkey and choruses of praise began to erupt. What was happening? The Holy Spirit was convicting people's hearts, and they were falling on their faces, and they're saying, I have no choice but to worship Him. Wow. See, when grace hits your heart and you realize that he sees everything but still loves you 
still wants to be with you, still has a plan for your life, is working in you, is moving in you, died for you, rose again for you. When you begin to realize that and he sees all the mess, you just fall on your face and you go, man, are you kidding me? I mean, there are times for me, and it's probably the same with you, that I'm just sitting in my prayer time, and it's like the devil begins to go over the laundry list of sin with me. You ever been there? You know, I'm trying to press into the Lord, and then the devil comes up and goes, you can't be praying, man. You did this wrong. You did this wrong. You did this wrong. And then the Holy Spirit comes and speaks and goes, okay, it's okay. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. You're covered. Jesus covered it for you. And by the end of the process, I'm just like, I forget what I was supposed to be praying about. I'm just like, are you kidding me? Are you for real? You love me? You want me, the mess that I am? That's why worship is beautiful, church. That's why I named this church a worship center. Because our reaction to his grace and his love and the work on the cross when he has his hands stretched out and nails driven through them, a crown of thorns on his head and he's bleeding and he's suffering and he's gasping for breath. And the whole time all he's thinking about is you. That's all he's thinking about. Crying out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He is standing even on the cross. He's standing as our mediator. Think about that. When it should have been about him, when he should have been saying, Lord, strengthen me, help me get through this. He didn't say any of that. No, as a Passover lamb, sacrificed willingly, he said, Father, forgive them. There's nothing to do but worship. So we see this work of the gospel where Jesus presents himself to you. And in faith, you prophesy and you begin to say, this is Jesus. The prophet of Nazareth, the king. In another gospel, it says, the king of Israel. They recognized who he was. And at that moment, in your life, salvation comes. The cross has its beautiful work in you and you're redeemed and you're set free. Amen. Amen. And then I love this because, again, it tells the story of the working of the gospel. What does he do right when this takes place? Let's read on in Matthew 21, 12, and 13. It says this, then Jesus, I love this Jesus right here, man. Woo-wee. And then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, and excuse me as I say it as he said it, it is written that my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, if you're not very familiar with what this text actually means, it says, some people says that he went and grabbed a whip and was driving people out of the temple. Think about that. Whoo, he was mad. This is the first The first glimpse that we get of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? Because he is merciful Savior all the way through the Gospels. And then all of a sudden he freaks out, freaks out and drives out all the thieves and the money changes. What were they doing? They were taking advantage of God's people who were coming to sacrifice. They were charging them double of what an animal should cost so that they could sacrifice unto the Lord. And they were stealing that money from the people of God that were coming in to worship. Just a side note, God takes it very seriously when you steal from the people of God. Anyway. And he came in, and what did he do? He drove them out. He pushed them out of the temple. Now, what does that have to do with the work of the gospel? When you say and you accept Jesus into your life, he rushes into the temple of your body, which is your heart. And he begins to drive out the unrighteousness. He begins to purge the thief in you, the adulterer in you, the unrighteousness in you. Come on now, the greed in you, the anger in you, all of that stuff. He gets violent about it. He becomes upset because you know what? This is my house, says the Lord, and I will make this temple This temple, a house of prayer, a house for my glory. And he comes in with his whip in his hand and begins to drive out all the things of junk in your life that you've dealt with for years, your addictions, your iniquities, your unrighteousness, the stuff that he hates, he has come in to drive out for you. 
See, it's not your work. It's his work. Just worship him. Fall in love with him. Invite him into your heart on a daily basis. Ask him to cleanse you out, and he will. Your notes say this. A heart that lives in true surrender to Christ, combined with a mouth that is full of thanksgiving, (laughs) results in an open door for the redeeming power of the gospel. It's right up here if I'm going too fast for you. Say it again. A heart that lives in true surrender to Christ, combined with a mouth that is full of thanksgiving, we see it played out here, results in an open door for the redeeming power of the gospel. Let me just say this. Well, let me say this before I say this. (laughs) In your notes, it says this. (laughs) Can I say, say this one more time? The work of the cross starts within you. And then works its way outside of you. You notice that Jesus went into the temple first to cleanse it. He didn't start on the outside cleaning the windows. No, he went right to the heart, right to the inner part of the temple. Started driving out the iniquity, the unrighteousness, the thievery, all the gluttony that was going on in there. He'd been to clean it out. It's the same thing with the work of the cross in us. It starts on the inside of you. But so many Christians... Do it the other way. Well, I've come to Jesus now, so i got to get all cleaned up within myself. I've got to make myself right. I've got to begin to live this sanctified and moral life. And you know what? You will, but only out of an abundance of the work of the cross in your life. Fall in love with Jesus. Fall in love with what he's done for you. Fall in love with the journey to the cross. Realize how precious and how sacred of a price was paid for you. Invite him in full of faith saying, Lord, cleanse me today. I know that you can. Allow him to have his work in you. Quit trying to clean yourself up. You can't do it. You can't do it. Everything that I have overcome in my life has been a result of overwhelming praise and thanksgiving for Jesus Christ. I've been so motivated by my love for him, not my love to live right, but my love for him. I don't want to do this anymore. Why? Because I love him more. And this takes away from that. So this is easy to leave because I want all of that. Do you get what I'm saying? It starts on the inside. Too many Christians are trying to clean up the windows of their house and, eh, let me play church. Eh." Man, come in broken, full of your junk. Get into this place on a daily basis. You know, we're not here to judge you. I will say as the pastor, I'm not here to judge you. Uh, That's not my job. That seat of judge is taken. And the one who sits in it, his name is Jesus. And I dare not sit in that man's seat. So I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to love you, encourage you, point you to the gospel, point you to the cross each and every week and say, come on. Come on. He wants you. He loves you. He will work in you. He is faithful. How do I know that? Because he does it in me. If he does it in me, he will do it for you. Amen. (laughs) When Christ invades your heart, he overturns the wickedness of humanity and replaces it with the glory of his kingdom. So what he did in the temple, it's what he does in his new temple, which the word of God, Apostle Paul, he says, is your body, your life. You are now the temple of God. So when Christ invades your heart, he overturns the wickedness of humanity and replaces it with the glory of his kingdom. Matthew 21, verse 14 And this is where it gets really, really good. So think about it. Jesus enters in, people crying out, praising his name. He goes straight to the temple, drives out the money changers and the thieves, turns tables over. He's probably the disciples are like, what? Who, what? What's he doing, right? People are freaking out. He's got a whip in his hand, as some commentators say, driving people out. Verse 20, or chapter 21, verse 14 says, Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Other versions say he invited the blind and the lame into the temple. 
Now see, at first glance, that may not be a big deal to you, but as we see in our notes, the blind and the lame were banned from David's palace, from the temple. Did you know that? Couldn't go in. Outcasts could not go in to worship. Now think about that for a moment. What if I stood at the door and said, no, you're too sinful. You can't come in here. And everybody who's just passing by, you're going, eh, I get to go in, you don't. Think about that for a moment. David, in 2 Samuel 5.8, if you want to go and research it, it's in there. Go read it. 2 Samuel 5.8, banned the blind and the lame from coming in to worship God because they were looked down upon as disgraceful and sinful. They were too shameful to be on there. But on this day, <laughs> on this day, Jesus came and said, come on in. The water's fine. Think about that for a moment. Drove all the quote-unquote righteous leaders out of the house and brought in all the disgraced children into the house. Think about what a day that was for them. Some of them probably watched for years and years and years and years and years, celebrating Passover each and every season, watching people go in, and some of them were just brokenhearted. Jesus made a statement, and he opened the doors wide, and he said, all who are lame, all who are sick, all of you who are disgraced and outcasts, come on in here. I'm going to put my hands on you and heal you and touch you. He made his house a house of love and acceptance that day. He was making such a triumphant statement. He's saying, you know what? Those days of keeping people out are over. I died for these just like I'm going to die for you. Bring them on in here. Let's get them healed. The state and the honor of his temple lie not in those things wherein the magnificence of princes' palaces is supposed to consist. Christ in the temple by his word there preached and in answer to the prayers there made heals those that are spiritually blind and lame. Your notes say this. The church today should look more like a hospital than a museum. Where Jesus is the chief surgeon and his people are either practitioners or patients. They're either helping him heal or they're getting healed. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, he said, Come to me, all you who labor or are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, the awesome thing about that work today, and I was talking with David about this yesterday, David Brooks. And not only did he heal them, but think about his act of bringing them into the temple took away their shame. Jesus and his work on the cross has taken your shame. You have nothing to be ashamed of if you are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the creator of the universe loves you, has accepted you, and is healing you. Come on now. We are all works in progress. I'm not more righteous than you, and I have bad news for you. You're not more righteous than me. We're all in this bucket together. Hey, Matthew 21, 15 and 16, and then the chief priests, <laughs> the Pharisees, the scribes, the ones who are supposed to be in charge of the church, here they come. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these things and what they are saying? In your notes say this, leave it to the religious to revile the revival. Leave it to the religious leaders. Oh, things are getting a little out of control here. 
We've got to bring this down a few notches. The children are dancing in the temple. You got the lame and the sick in here. People are going too nuts. There's too much freedom in this church. (laughs) The religious love to revile the revival. Don't be upset if you see somebody up here worshiping and dance and praise. They're just realizing they've been healed. Well, they should be dignified in church. Really? After reading this, you think that's the case. You think that's what Jesus came to do. Again, let's not make church like a museum. Oh, don't touch this. Oh, don't do that. No, see, be quiet. Shh, bip, shh. Oh, don't say anything. You know, it's no, uh-uh. it's a hospital. Let's get nuts. <laughs> he was nuts for you. Let's get nuts for him. Someone gets free in this place and begins to worship freely. You just go right on, Jesus. Get them. And if you're not there to worship that way, don't get mad at them for doing it because then you're getting religious. Oh, well, that's not the way church should be. Well, then you need to find another church because this church is free. Proud men, in our notes, proud men love honor except when it's given to others. They love to be complimented, right? But then they get indignant when other people receive honor, mainly when Jesus begins to receive honor. Hmm. Proud men love honor, except when it's given to others. Next, when Christ is highly honored, (laughs) I love this, his enemies are most displeased. I'll say it again. When Christ is highly honored, his enemies are most displeased. If you really want to tick the devil off from missing with you all week long, get into this place and praise the Lord like there's no tomorrow. He'll get so mad at you. He'll be like, wait a minute. Nothing I do seems to work. You won't shut your mouth about Jesus. Would you just shut up? If you really want to get back at him, if you want to take your vengeance out on him, as one of my mentors used to say, if you want to kick the devil in the face, then praise. Worship his name. Lift up the name of Jesus at all times. Everywhere you go, lift up the cross. Remind people that Jesus is Lord because that will drive him nuts. He will be infuriated by it. Why? Because when Christ is highly honored, his enemy is most displeased. And Jesus said to them, he answered their accusations in Matthew 21, 16. He said, and Jesus said to them, yes, I hear what they're saying. And have you never read that out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise? What great things are brought about by weak and unlikely instruments? God is thereby much honored because his strength is is perfected in our weakness. Hallelujah. You may feel like an unlikely instrument today, but through the cross, great things can come from you. Amen. That the gospel says, I have a plan for your life. Redemption has come into your house, into your heart. I will cleanse you of your unrighteousness. I will bring you into my life. I will give you the life that I have lived, says Jesus. And I will make beautiful things out of the dust. That's what the gospel says. Isn't it beautiful?